Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're excited to be talking with Stephanie Everett, President and Community Team Lead at Lawyerist, about starting and growing a law firm. She's also the co-author of the recent book, The Small Firm Roadmap. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together with the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're excited to be talking with Stephanie Everett, President and Community Team Lead at Lawyerist, about starting and growing a law firm. She's also the co-author of the recent book, The Small Firm Roadmap. So welcome, Stephanie. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Well, to get started, would you mind giving our listeners just a brief overview of your career background so they have some context? Yeah, sure. So I am a lawyer, graduated from law school and jumped into big law, and then uh had no intention of starting my own practice, quite frankly. I thought I'd just retire from that firm. But then about five or six years into practice, had an opportunity to start a firm with a partner. And so we did. So we jumped and started our own uh, small firm doing real estate litigation, business litigation. Grew that from a team of two to 20 in just under seven years. And then I decided to kind of shift my focus and help lawyers figure out how to grow their firm. Um, Because I realized all my colleagues and friends were coming to me saying, how did you do this thing? And I realized some of the things I had figured out about being a business owner might not be so obvious to other lawyers. Um, And so that's, yeah, that's just taken me on a crazy path for the past couple of years of, of doing lots of different ways you know, lots of different things to to train and coach attorneys. And is that how you got involved with Lawyerist? Yeah, Sam and I met at, a, well, we I went to their conference as an attendee and then met them. And then Sam and I were speaking at a conference together and had dinner. And next thing you know, I had a new job. So you never wow. know what a conference, well, you never know what a conference <laughs> or dinner is going to lead to, right? You know, that's what we always say. You just really don't know. Um, yeah, I met Sam years ago at a conference. He did not offer me a job, but he was very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Um, and if people just want to find out more about you and your work, where should they look for that? Yeah, head to lawyerist.com, lawyer IST, and um, you can find me there and probably some other places like LinkedIn and Twitter, but don't ask me my Twitter handle because I don't know it. Yeah, I went cold <laughs> turkey on that. Don't tell the, uh, it's all it's all the uh, automated stuff now. Don't tell anyone. Um, yeah. So for people who are not familiar with Lawyerist, could you just give us a brief overview about what that is and what it does? Yeah, so we really started, you know, about 11 years ago, maybe as a a legal tech blog, because that was a thing then that not many people were talking about. And since then, um, the site has evolved and grown and so has the company. And so it's really a great resource to go to our site and you can find a ton of content about the practice of law, the business side of running a law firm, innovation and technology. We now have our own podcast. And then a couple of years ago when I joined the team, really developed this idea of community. So how could we help lawyers even more beyond the website? And so now we have conferences and programs where attorneys can can pay to actually come in and, and get business coaching and discover even more content about how to run their business because unfortunately there are no HR or accounting or business school you know business classes in law school they they need I think some are starting so that's that good. would be great but, yeah as soon as we finish this I actually have a call with a QuickBooks consultant because these are all the things they don't teach you in law school about what you're going to need to do later if you start a business exactly um, so you work with a lot of lawyers obviously who are sort of trying to start or grow their firms what kind of mistakes do you see people making just over and over again I mean, I think the first like sort of fundamental mistake is realizing we have this idea when we come out of law school that we can just hang a shingle and which is great. And, and so we start a business and a lot of folks don't put that together that when you do that, you actually are starting a business. And so (laughs) exactly (laughs) now all of these things fall onto your shoulders. So, you know, from 
technology and the you know software and like you mentioned accounting and quickbooks and invoicing and getting paid and what do you do when someone doesn't pay you and marketing your firm and how do you get clients to to hire you and sales process and then how do you deliver an amazing client experience i mean law school teaches us how to think like lawyers and a little bit how to practice law um hanging your own shingle and doing it on your own just adds a whole another layer of complexity I think the biggest mistake lawyers struggle with is realizing they're now business owners. And what does that mean to wear a business owner's hat? No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, if you told me in law school, I would be running a business, I would have said that you were crazy, that I had no interest in that. And then I would have said next, like, well, there's no way I could do that. I, there's, I don't know any of these things that I would need to know. But the reality is you can learn them. But, you know, it is something you have to approach and learn or you're probably not going to successfully run your business. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so most of our listeners are still in law school. Is this too early to be thinking about starting a practice? I mean, do you think it's realistic to plan to do this right out of law school? So I know a lot of um, attorneys who do, so I guess the answer is no. And actually, one of the things that I ended up doing um, in at one point is I started an incubator here in Georgia for newer lawyers who wanted to start a socially conscious law firm. And I worked with all the law schools to put that program together. And so actually I've worked with about 40 or 50 attorneys who came right out of law school and decided to start their own practice. So the answer is it absolutely can be done, but the um, bad news is it is, it's hard. <laughs> I would imagine it's very hard. And this is, is this the Lawyers for Equal Justice project you're talking about? Ex exactly. Yeah. Because now you're being asked to not just figure out how to start your practice and grow a business, but you're also sort of still figuring out how to practice law because I always say that one of the hardest things to do as a newer lawyer is figure out who to mail what to when. And I guess now there's e-filing, so maybe that analogy isn't even good anymore. But um, Well, definitely you got to figure out how to use that, which is not even that easy. <laughs> I would always be like to my secretary, like, how do we file this again? <laughs> what, which buttons do we need to check? How do we do this? Yeah, it's definitely not something right. you do in law school. <laughs> Yeah, and so there's just like lots of little technical things that you need to figure out with the practice of law, um, you know, and, and so if you're, th if you're in law school and you're thinking this is the path that I want to go, I think it's really becomes that much more important to get all the hands-on experience that you can while you're in law school. So take advantage of those interns and externs at ships and, um, you know, working with, with lawyers so that you can be exposed to what the day-to-day -day practice of law is like and you have an understanding of, of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And for people who are interested in starting a firm, do you think it's important in law school that they sort of focus or specialize in a certain area or do you think that's just not realistic? I mean, it's, it's tough to do, but the sooner you can specialize and focus, I think the easier your path becomes. Because um, when folks would come into Lawyers for Equal Justice, they would often say, but I don't know what I'm interested in yet. I want to experiment. I want to try lots of things. And that's great. And you certainly can. But imagine now you're trying to do all the things, run a business and and get new clients in and suddenly you now have to figure out what the estate planning process looks like and research that and then somebody calls you and says they have a divorce and you're like oh well maybe that's interesting let me figure that out well that involves a whole nother line of thinking and other things to to think about and I mean even if you want to take like that that example might sound ridiculous but I saw people doing it but even within family law like if we if you say okay I want to be a family lawyer even divorce looks very different than custody, which looks different than, you know, we have legitimation here in Georgia that looks different, you know, so all of these things take time to learn and figure out and then also develop your systems and your processes so that the back end piece can be easier and you're not always reinventing the wheel. So I know as, as new lawyers, you're excited and you want to um, try lots of things and get exposure to lots of things. But the problem, and that's great, and I want you to do that too, but the, the sooner you focus on, okay, here's my path, just the easier it will be to build your business. It's just reality. Yeah, you know, I 100% agree with that. I mean, I flipped through the book that we're going to talk about later that you guys have written. Um, and, you know, I saw a lot of stuff that you see. And anytime you're talking about setting up your own business about, well, who's your ideal client? You know, how are you going to serve this person? What are you offering them? So it's a little shocking. I mean, it's not shocking, a little surprising to me that people were coming into this incubator and saying, well, I don't really know exactly what type of law I want to practice yet. It seems like 
I would assume that would be kind of the first step before you decide you're going to go out on your own and do it. Right. Well, or they'd have an idea and then they'd see what their neighbor was doing and they'd think, well, that looks interesting. Right, maybe <laughs> patterns for me. <laughs> yeah. And I would be like, no, you got to stay, stay with what you know. Come on. And, uh, and there were a couple, per- there, most of the participants did know, but I'm thinking of a few that if they heard this right now, they'd be smiling going, oh, she's talking about me because I- that was a, a struggle. <laughs> Brian, struggle then, I mean, how do you kind of help people in that scenario? Or if someone's in law school listening to this, you know, how can people sort of figure out like what the right area for them is when they haven't had this experience? So it is hard to know. Yeah, you know, I might give advice that's probably different than when, you know, what we typically hear is follow your passion and do what you love. And look, I'm a big advocate of following passions and be and loving what you do. And I think that needs to be an element of it. But I think you have an opportunity if you're in law school listening to this and this is something you're thinking about. um, I think you have an opportunity to maybe approach it a little bit differently. Um, And so I had a, I was at um, a local law school here on Monday teaching a course on interviewing and that guy came up to me and said, hey, I have kids and it's really important to me that I don't, I don't want to work like I'm older. This is a second career for me and I don't want to do what I think, you know, for young attorneys have to do. And I was like, well, that's great. Think about your practice area in those terms, because there are practice areas that don't require that you work late to prepare for trial the next day. So maybe that's something you want to take advantage of. You know, talk to people and really understand what it is you want to do and and think about that as you're picking your practice area as well. Um, Because all of those things, because if, if you pick a practice that requires that you go to trial a whole bunch late night prep might just be part of your life for a little while. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing <laughs> I that mean, would be true. Yes. I mean, having been a patent you're, litigator, I would say yes. That's, that's Unless you're really super organized and, you know, get ahead of it. But I think most people would say, yeah, if you're going to court a lot, like it's just, it's just a very intense practice. Um, but estate planning, on the other hand, a lot of times, unless you have someone on their deathbed who really needs a will, you know, most people can wait a few weeks for you to finish their plan. And so you can have more of a normal work schedule, I suppose. Yeah, and I think that's such a great point, too, about sort of thinking about how work fits into the rest of your life, which is something that's definitely not impressed upon most law students. Um, and I think that's a great part of the the book, too, is just sort of, you know, this is a holistic view of how does all of this stuff fit together. It's not just about, you know, practicing law if you're yeah. going to be running a business. I mean, you, you get to kind of design the business to suit what you want your life to be. Yeah, and I think that's what's what I'm so excited about right now and and we talk about this some in the book too is I think there's a huge opportunity the practice of law is changing I hope I mean I hope people are finally getting into this idea that our clients are expecting different things from us so if you're you know if you're approaching this with fresh eyes or maybe bringing experience that you have from other industries I think you have a real opportunity to create something that does look very different than what all the attorneys have been doing for the past couple of hundred years and so I would encourage you also to to look into the marketplace and see who's being served but more importantly what's not being served what where are those opportunities to create new markets instead of just jumping into an already, you know, really crowded market doing what everyone else is doing? You have to really think about what is it that you want to create with your business and how is that going to look different in the marketplace? What type of things are you excited about, just sort of generally speaking? Um, killing the billable hour because I think it's the <laughs> worst. Thing Doesn't in the world. really work for anyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Like I always say, it, it, I feel like every point one I build suck a little bit of my soul uh, away. Yeah, honestly, because- that was one of the key reasons I had to quit working in a firm. Is apparently I just don't have the personality type, like literally, that can handle that. I just could not do it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I did. I build, I build a lot of hours. I have, you know, I can still remember the the most hours I've ever billed in a month. Um, I remember I was well over 300 at trial certain months. That was yeah. Fun. Yeah. And you, and people don't really appreciate what that means. It sounds because people think, Oh, 40 hours a week. And I'm like, no, it, you have to work a lot more. Than yeah. That's not 40. Until 40. <laughs> no, yeah. um, I think people just don't have any conception of what it does to your life. Like, you know, but having somebody well, else own your time hour by hour, I felt was really soul killing. 
Yeah, and here's what I really hated about it. Before I went to law school, I had a job where if I had a really awesome week and I got all my work done on Friday, I could maybe kick off a few hours exactly. early and like go enjoy <laughs> myself and kind of have a little reward. When you bill by the hour, there's no there's no taking off early on Friday. It just means you have to bill it at some other time because yeah. that's the only way you're going to make your numbers. And I, so to me, that's one of the worst things about the billable hours it doesn't really encourage innovation it doesn't encourage efficiency it doesn't give you an incentive to figure out how to do your work faster and better and maybe use technology and other tools to help you do it because the only you only make money for the hours that you put down and I think that's just a that doesn't help you or the client it's just a backwards way of thinking about it it really is I was coming from a programming background to law and so I would come into these you know people would say oh can you do this thing I'm like you realize we could do this a lot more efficiently if we just did x y and z using technology and they're like do you understand our business model um we don't want you to do this more efficiently basically and I was like oh wow oh this is really weird <laughs> Right. What a crazy thing to say if you just sat there and thought about that. No, what, I mean, you know, it was shocking. And if, and right, and if a client heard someone say that, <laughs> like, yeah, no, I, I want you to do my, you know, and that's not what I'm. Ultimately, from the client's perspective, they're not paying you for your time. They're right. paying you for a result. They're paying you for something very different. And so, I think as we continue to explore that and realize that as a profession, then the opportunities for us just open up because I, that's, in my opinion, what leads to more interesting ways of serving our clients and all of this stuff starts working together um, to help our clients, but also help us so we can make more money and work less and have a, uh, and at the same time, though, provide a really valuable experience to our clients. No, I think that all I, I believe that is all doable. And I'm interested always to see people who are doing it because it's surprising to me that so few lawyers are. Um, well, let's shift gears a little bit. So if someone's listening to this and like, this sounds great, like I really want to do this. Um, do you think students need to be looking at things outside of strictly the law context? Like even if they're still in law school, like do they need to be taking business classes, learning about marketing? Like what should they be doing to kind of get up to speed on these new options? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, they might not have a lot of time to take a lot of extra classes. I'm just being realistic. (laughs) Maybe in third year, but that's where you could be working with another lawyer and getting that hands-on experience. Because I think that, I think the marketing and and the business stuff you can learn, but learning how the practice of law works probably is harder and not really available to you, you know, Mm -hmm. in another in another way. But I think now what's so great about the internet and just the way things work, I feel like I was sounded really old saying that. Oh, the internet. <laughs> oh, the internet. Well, I mean, I remember yeah. not having an email address. I remember getting yeah. one. So, yeah. M- me too. And I know that probably will freak my daughter out one day, but yes. Um, but also like there are so many resources online and available, pod- you know, podcasts and books and Um, courses online and classes and community like ours where you can fill in those business gaps and 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 learn it I think the key is that you have to be willing to go seek those things out and really learn from them but that's what's nice is you're not just restricted to that traditional loss our traditional classroom experience that you that you have in law school so I so I'd say if you're in law school definitely focus on your your law your law classes and get some as much experience as you can. Um, Yeah. And then start exploring these ideas. How does marketing work? What is, you know, if content marketing, how does strategic marketing, there's a lot of terms that get thrown around. And I think one of the mistakes attorneys make is they think they just need to do a lot of stuff. Right. And, and I'm like, no, you just need to do the right things. So, you know, we talk about this in the book, having a strategic marketing plan that you already mentioned starts with, who is it you're trying to attract and then how can we attract those people? What tools do we need to use? Um, you know, if you don't know, if, if you don't understand finances and you want to open your own firm, then maybe there are books and you can take some classes in, in online on finance and what it what does it mean? There's a great book on, um, there's several great books w- that we recommend that really kind of help you understand the... Um, financial aspects of running a business so greg crabtree has one called simple numbers um 
there's another one that the t- authors escaped me, but I feel like it's called Accounting for the Numerophobic. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But I need you to check both this. of these out. We've got, we finally decided after like nine years in business to get serious about our financial books. <laughs> and so I'm like taking notes on these actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And I love them because they, because a lot of people, that's what a lot of people do, right? Like no judgment. That's how a lot of people approach it. And when we really kind of get clear on and understand how the back end of our business works and why it's important and what numbers we should be paying attention to, because that's part of the problem too, is we just focus on the wrong things. Then we can start making some proactive decisions about our business. Sorry, you can see I get really excited about this. No, this is really great. I'm literally taking notes on it right now because this is a conversation we've been having since our uh, retreat in January where we literally spent about eight hours going through and recategorizing things in QuickBooks because we're like, this is insane. Like whoever set this up did not do this correctly and no one ever really looked at it. So um, yeah, I really encourage people if they are going to start a business to figure out at least the basics. Um, And I think, you know, for me, like there's never been anything that I needed to know that I couldn't find online. I think you're absolutely Right. right. Like all of this is out there. Even when I was and, a patent litigator, I was thinking like, oh, I'm going to start my own firm. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about marketing. What can I do? Oh, I'll sign up for a course on content marketing. Okay. Now I know something about that. You know, it's right. like, it's not rocket science. And to be fair, if I could just give the plug, I mean, lawyers.com is designed to be your starting point. So if you go there, we have the basics of everything you need and we have download templates and things you can download because we, we are designing our site to be your starting point for every solo small firm business owner or you know, lawyer in the U.S. Like come to us first that's our goal. Yeah, I do not reinvent the wheel here. It's absolutely (laughs) unnecessary. Go to lawyers, check it out. Tell me a little bit more about this book too, because this is fairly new, The Small Firm Roadmap, right? Yeah, we just wrote it um, or just published it a couple months ago. And it is also written to be sort of that guide for the for how to build a law firm that's designed really for the future of the practice of law. There's, you know, there's been other books before. We don't need to mention those. Um, But we really wanted to take a different approach with our book and make sure that we were addressing these changes that we see happening in the industry right now, in the world right now, like this idea, you know, we're fools if we don't think that Uber and Hulu and all the things that, you know, Amazon those are impacting our us, our lives, but also how our clients perceive, you know, services and how they want to see services delivered to them. Right. And so we, we think that presents a huge opportunity for lawyers that in the past um, they haven't really focused on that. And here's a chance for them to now capitalize on it and create a firm that answers an undressed need. Yeah, which I think that's like, you know, there's several things in there that are super interesting. I mean, one is people sort of focus just on like, oh, it's legal Zoom or it's my bespoke law practice. And I think there's so much room in between. And then also this unmet need is so big. You know, we have this access to justice issue. And I think ideally, you know, a lot of these firms, you know, new firms, people thinking differently may be able to actually solve some of those problems and get people services that they just literally can't afford right now. Absolutely. Um And is that kind of the idea behind this Lawyers for Equal Justice? Like when you say they have a social justice component, what are we talking about? So Lawyers for Equal Justice was a program that was um, started here in in Georgia where I live by the five law schools in in collaboration with the State Bar of Georgia and the Georgia Supreme Court. And And there's programs like it all over the U.S. now, which is super exciting. And the idea was we know that more and more students are graduating law school and deciding to open their own practice. And often they they don't have the tools and the skills that they need, right? We, we just discussed all those reasons why. So how can we help them? And so we created a legal incubator that helped teach them those business skills, but also in order for them to get some of the on-the-job training that they needed, we added in a social justice component so that they were also doing pro bono work and low bono work, Um, and trying to fill that unmet need that you just referenced. There's so many people out there that need attorneys, they need legal help, and they don't know how to get it or they can't afford it. And so what can we do to kind of use these newer lawyers to help create socially conscious law firms that can help sort of bridge this gap? I think that's so important. If you look at the statistics, I mean, it's just appalling, Um, you know, the unmet need that's out there for really important stuff like child custody and, you know, employer you know employment and rental stuff like it just goes on and on so i do think you know 
there are opportunities and it's kind of an exciting time, I would imagine, to be starting a practice, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I was on the phone with someone earlier today and and she just told me, you know, I just have such a big heart and she ends up saying yes to clients that she's like, I know they can't afford me, but I just help them anyway. <laughs> and um, all right, a lot of lawyers do this. And then they, what do they do? They end up with AR problems because they, they, they continue to provide the same services that they always provide and then they bill them for it and then the client can't pay and then they it's just a whole big mess. So I was like, I've I said to her, I said, you know, it's like clients are coming into you and you're you're delivering them the Porsche and selling them on the Porsche when they're maybe they have a Honda budget. I don't know if that analogy works, but you oh, get totally, it. Totally, absolutely. And I was like, what if instead of just offering Porsche, which is full service litigation, what if you could create other packages for them that would fit with their budget? Like what if you only helped them at mediation because maybe that was a really important time in their, or if you provided a legal coaching service where you gave them some templates that they would need and then an hour of coaching that helped explain the process and gave them information so that they could go and represent themselves. Like what if you, if we had more conversations with our clients on the front end and really understood what it was they need and then built things that we could deliver to to help that and I said and you can still offer the Porsche for the people who can afford it but then instead of just you know and like this light bulb went off in her head and she was like oh my gosh you mean I could help everybody like (laughs) based on what they could afford and I was like yeah why not so that's what we're starting to work on for her is how do we put some packages together based on what her clients need and what they can afford and what she can deliver and again that's where technology and efficiency can start coming into play and helping us um create these products that are more repeatable and easy um, to scale. So I guess that's also what I get excited about, right? It's just, there's just all this opportunity. And so if you're listening, I mean, this is my message to all the law students. Like we don't have to do it the same way that you've seen it done. You can come in and create something brand new and really service clients and, and meet their needs because they need the help. Yeah, absolutely. And potentially your profit margins are way higher on these things that you create and sell again versus the ones you're doing per hour. But that's probably a longer conversation. How, right. um, let me ask you one question on that point. How problematic do you think the state bar and the regulation aspects of this are in terms of coming in and saying, oh, well, you can't do that because of this or that? Like, have, are they opening up at all? I think we're seeing movement there. It's slow because, you know, it's look at our industry. It just, that's how it goes. Um, <laughs> it is what it but is. Right. But we know right now in California, there's been a, a group for the state bar working on proposed new rules and what it could look like to open up some of these regulations. You know, the, the, the big one, the most controversial one is should we allow non-lawyer ownership and investment in firms? Mm-hmm. Um, and of course the investor, I mean, they're out there and they see the opportunity so that you know that they would love it um we have been a little uh protect maybe not protect maybe protectionist is probably the best word i was trying to see if i could (laughs) if i could come off of that word a little bit reluctant yeah i I mean it it would be a big change and people are you know there's people out there crying that this is going to be horrific for clients and i think that's the key is we if we put our clients at the center of what we're trying to do um I think there I think there's a middle ground. I think there's a way to open it up and and make this better and serve more people. Right. right? I mean, there's just it's like you're actually not the client's not worse off if the answer if the question is do they get any type of service at all that can help them or do they get nothing? I mean, I would argue giving them something that's useful is actually better than nothing. Right. But I'm Absolutely. an ex lawyer, so what do I know? <laughs> Um, All right. Well, Stephanie, we're about out of time here. Any final thoughts for listeners who are thinking about this solo small firm route? Um, Yeah, you know what, actually, so one of the things that I do at Lawyerist is I facilitate one of our programs for attorneys who um, have their own practice and want to learn more about running their business. And it involves coaching and workshops and conferences. Every year, um, we have a scholarship program. So if you're opened up to graduating 3Ls and anyone, I guess, for the first year that they're out of school. So if that's you, if you're in law school, and you know, you're graduating this year, and you want to open your own practice or have that plans to do that in the future, um, definitely keep an eye out for that scholarship announcement because you could have an opportunity to win a free year of coaching and help with us. And I think that's really cool. 
That sounds amazing. Um, how would people find out more about that and also connect with you and possibly get the book? Yeah, go to lawyerist.com to connect with me. And um, and my email is stephanie at lawyerist.com. And I'll, I don't know if there's an announcement up quite yet about the scholarship, but if certainly, you know, that's where it will go. So even if you want to email me, I can make sure to let you know when we announce this year's scholarship. Um, and the book is available at Amazon, and there's an audio version now, and you can find out more, too, at our website, which is lawyerist.com slash book. All right. Well, we will link to all of that. We'll double check those links um, and make sure they are correct in the show notes. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us. This is a really interesting and fantastic conversation. Awesome. Thank you for having me and listening and being excited about it. My pleasure. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app because we would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at, you guessed it, lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.